Good day to the Chief Executive Officer of the National Research Foundation, Dr. Malapo Kubela, otherwise, no, otherwise known as Dr. Q. Colleagues from our, across our continent, Africa, and around the globe, a special warm welcome to our speakers and guests from the National Research Foundation, the Department of Science and Innovation, the Science Granting Council's initiative partners, the University of Pretoria family and friends. This afternoon, we celebrate the launch of a very special book entitled Management of Research Infrastructures, A Funding Perspective, authored by UP's very own Head of Research Capacity Development, Dr. Rakeshni Ramato Prishal, and co-authored by Dr. Sepo Hachingota, the Director for Strategic Planning and Partnerships at, from the National Research Foundation. The open source book was published by Springer earlier this year with support and funding from the National Research Foundation and Department of Science and Innovation with the objective of providing a blueprint for our colleagues working in research management at funding agencies, universities, and government. Dear colleagues, research infrastructures, which includes research equipment, pilot plants, that is small production plants that test processes before they are commercialized, technology demonstrators, proof concepts to showcase possible applications, feasibility, performance, and methods of ideas for new technologies, and specialized facilities for high-tech sectors such as aerospace form the bedrock of innovation on which our esteemed research institutions are able to advance knowledge and bring theory into practice as well as into the lives of people. The unique proposition of this book is that it provides a holistic approach to the management of research infrastructure grants and equipment. The book further provides critical elements of the research infrastructure life, life cycle that have been carefully threaded together, and hence I call upon our speakers for today to share with us the role this book plays in shaping the management of research infrastructures within the higher education landscape in Africa by sharing national examples. I would then like to, without further ado, introduce our first speaker. Our first guest speaker is Dr. Daniel Adams. I nearly confused you with another Adams. I think it's Rob Adams. Chief Director, Basic Sciences and Infrastructure of the Department of Science and Innovation in South Africa. He has spearheaded this portfolio within the department since 2007 and has developed programs to support and promote the basic sciences and has ensured the availability of and access to internationally comparable research and innovation infrastructures in order to generate new knowledge and train new researchers. In this regard, he has developed funding instruments for the acquisition of research equipment at universities, the national research facilities, and the science councils. He has played a key role in the rollout of the South African National Research Network, SANREN, as the Department of Science and Innovation's broadband connectivity program to support research, development, and innovation has been the driver for the establishment of the National Center for High Performance Computing and the Data Research Initiative of South Africa, DIRISA, all of which form key elements of the National Integrated Cyber Infrastructure System. One of his, his recent accomplishment is the development and implementation of a South African research infrastructure roadmap, which was launched in 2016, which guides the strategic development acquisition and deployment of large research innovation as a necessary and required enabler for RDI instead of the ad hoc approach used to date. Dr. Adams has worked alongside Rakesh in managing and establishing numerous research infrastructure platforms and funding instruments. One of the key highlights being the establishment of the high resolution microscopy center at the Nelson Mandela University, the only one of its kind on the continent and one of a few worldwide. 
Dr. Adams, you can take the podium. Uh, good afternoon to all our local and international attendees of this book launch. Thank you, Prof. Kupe, Program Director, for the kind words of introduction. Allow me to acknowledge the presence of senior management from the University of Pretoria, in particular, Prof. Kupe, the National Research Foundation, the Department of Science and Innovation, and other research institutions and representatives from the Science Granting Council's initiative participating countries. First and foremost, I would like to congratulate the authors, Drs. Rakeshni Ramato Piskal and Sepo Achakonta, on the launch of the book entitled Management of Research Infrastructures, the South African uh, Perspective. The publication of this nature and focus is, in my opinion, long overdue because it provides practical guidelines, principles, and good practices regarding effective management and sustainable funding of research infrastructures, which in turn are key elements for successful uh, implementation. Well done for an excellent piece of work. It also embodies Rikeshni's passion and dedication for contributing to the improvement of doing quality and comparative science. I know South Africa, this research community will significantly benefit from this publication. Rikeshni and I have worked closely together over the past 10 years or so in managing re the research infrastructure portfolio within the National Research Foundation and DSI. Therefore, this book also encapsulates the key messages learned and highlights celebrated in the journey towards provision of research infrastructures in South Africa. The genesis and context of the book stem from the significant investment DSI and NRF have made in research infrastructure facilities and platforms over the past 15 years. A total of about 2 billion rand was directly invested in the National Equipment Program and the National Research Facilities at the NRF over this period. Research is a critical tool to strengthening our communities and addressing some of the most pressing transnational issues of our time, climate change, food security, human health, poverty, ensuring the long-term sustainability of quality of life, and shaping the industrial and digital transitions are among the major themes requiring solutions and even a new ambition for South African and African science. The role of science and why, why government should support research and development was underscored by the then Deputy President uh, Muklanti at the Science Technology Innovation Summit of July 2013, when he said, I, and I open quotes, the benefits of science, technology, and innovation are not only potentially means for us, but more crucially constitute the preconditions of, for South Africa's development. Government knows only too well the indispensability of science, technology, innovation, if it is to deliver on the historical challenge of addressing social inequality, poverty, and unemployment. As research infrastructures, including cyber infrastructure or e-infrastructure, form the backbone of our competitiveness in science and innovation, the quality and the ability to provide the needed services and data largely determines our country's capacity to produce the new knowledge, innovation, and even understanding what South Africa needs to tackle these challenges that we face. It's also well known that research infrastructures are central to the so-called knowledge triangle of education, research, and innovation. It's in turn embedded in and integrated in a broader research infrastructure ecosystem involving industry, universities, and society. And it's in, within the context of this ecosystem that research infrastructures play a critical role in drive, driving knowledge generation and exploitation, accelerating technology development, training of new generations of scientists and science managers, technological and social innovation, providing capacity to address global challenges and combining the best available knowledge, human capital, and resources in one specific scientific area. 
for research infrastructure to successfully fulfill the aforementioned enabling role and function to establish and sustainably maintaining it to serve the needs of the scientific communities and other stakeholders. Adequate, sustainable and long-term funding and effective support and coordination are necessary and required conditions. However, sustainability of research infrastructures go well beyond just funding the entire research infrastructure life cycle that is from initial planning up to termination needs to be considered. Issues such as scientific excellence, unlocking the innovation potential, measuring socioeconomic impact, human capital development, as well as outreach are other crucial elements that needs to be taken into account. The challenge, however, is that research infrastructures are costly and ultimately funded by taxpayers. Therefore, given the growing strain on the public fiscus and competing priorities, that is the need for new schools, hospitals, housing, and now dealing with the impact of COVID-19, decision makers and funders are faced with major questions such as what is the net social benefit of costly research infrastructures and the public good they produce? What are the benefits for the society of, of supporting these investments and their operations? Therefore, the requirements for investments in large infrastructure projects should include clear articulation and translating research into meaningful impacts on people's lives. It requires actions that stretch well beyond those traditionally associated with knowledge generation only, such as publications. Knowledge uh, translation should therefore be prioritized and action to improve socioeconomic impact. An accepted measure of socioeconomic impact for large research infrastructure is cost benefit analysis, which is about measuring in money terms all the benefits and costs of the project to society, to appraise an investment decision in order to assess the welfare chains contributable to it and to facilitate a more efficient allocation of resources. The investments made by or in the national system of innovation since the inception of the department 25 years ago have enabled government to respond to the needs of the country, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic in crucial areas. The establishment of the national Integrated Cyber Infrastructure System, NICIS, which includes the Center for High Performance Computing, the South African National Research Network, Sunrem, continue to support successful and sustainable implementation of national projects such as Meerkat and the Square Kilometer Ray um, Telescope, as well as other large research infrastructures. Therefore, the CHPC played a major role in data analytics and modeling for tracking and predicting the spread of the coronavirus across the country. The recent paradigm shift and step change in the provision of large research infrastructure came with the launch of the South African Research Infrastructure Roadmap. The Sariri in 2016 it is the first of its kind in South Africa and is a strategic intervention that provides research infrastructure across in the entire public research system building on existing capabilities and taking into account uh, future needs. Sariri infrastructure include facilities, resources and services used by the scientific community across all disciplines for research, enabling the generation, exchange and preservation of knowledge and innovation. A total of about 1 billion rand was invested in Sariri research infrastructure since its inception in 2016. Although research infrastructure investments over the past 10 years have improved in South Africa, the system is still overwhelmed by challenges which not only require continued financial investments, but also strong governance, skilled human resources, management and monitoring and evaluation structures. A holistic view of research infrastructure investment is presented in this book by mapping the granting cycles from a funding agency perspective and in this area, I worked closely with Rakeshni over the years. The stride undertaken and lessons learned over the past decade will, within the science and technology sector in South Africa, are further highlighted while taking into account a more dynamic 
and a sustainable research infrastructure ecosystem uh, in the future. Me and SIPO also provide an overview of the STI landscape in South Africa and clearly outlines how the provision of research infrastructure has the potential to play a catalytic role in the advancement of science, technology and innovation endeavors. In addition, the book acts as a useful resource to ignite collaborative discussions and strengthen partnership with sister countries on the African continent. The sharing of good practices and learnings of the National Research Foundation and the Department of Science and Innovation in the management of the research infrastructure grants. So in conclusion, congratulations again to this achievement and thank you very much for your attention. Our next speaker is Dr. Tlomani, who is the Deputy Chief Executive Officer responsible for National Research Infrastructure platforms at the National Research Foundation. He has a wealth of research management experience, which spans over 24 years, part of which was at the MRC and 17 years, and were spent at the NRF, part of which were at the South African Astronomical Observatory and the National Zoological Gardens. He led the transformation of the NZG from a classical zoo to a research intensive entity and placed it on a trajectory to claim its place as a credible national research facilities. In his current role as the deputy CEO, National Research Infrastructure Platforms, Dr. Tlomani is responsible for leading the portfolio of national research facilities that currently operate in the following clusters. Astronomy and geosciences, biodiversity, environment, and conservation sciences, in addition, He's responsible for establishing and provisioning national research infrastructure located at universities and research institutions. Dr. Komani holds a doctoral qualification in monocular genetics from Rhodes University, which he obtained based on the research he conducted while working at the South African Institute for Aquatic Biodiversity. Over to you, Dr. Komani. Good day, uh, Professor Kupe, uh, uh, Dr. Kovela, who is the CEO of the NRF, my colleagues from the NRF, uh, colleagues from the Department of Science and Innovation, uh, science councils uh, from South Africa and across the continent. I've uh, worked with SIPO and, and Rakesh in their portfolio, portfolios on partnerships as well as research infrastructure, respectively. And the book that we are launching today highlights key aspects of research and innovation uh, value chain, which is aligned with the NRF's mandate uh, to promote and support research in order to contribute toward the socioeconomic well-being of society and its environment. This book further showcases uh, the value of research equipment and infrastructure platforms in knowledge advancement, as well as development of innovative solutions to address practical socioeconomic challenges. This is no more evident than with the portfolio of national research facilities managed by the NRF. Uh, for instance, the benefits of the South African um, Astronomical Observatory and the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory, which are national facilities of the NRF, extend beyond exciting imagination through science, but have far-reaching socioeconomic impact, as was demonstrated through the lead role that these two national research facilities played in the delivery of the National Ventilator Project, which is uh, one of the treatment modalities for COVID-19. The work of the South African Institute for Aquatic Biodiversity, for example, contributes not only to scientific understanding of aqu uh, aquatic systems, but also aspects of food security through knowledge generated for the management uh, of fisheries. At the South African uh, Environmental Observation Network, uh, you see a, an entity a research facility that's, uh, that serves as a major scientific resource for knowledge advancement and understanding of long-term environmental change at an ecosystem level. And that helps us to understand the current and future impacts of, uh, uh, of, of, things, like climate, or, of things like climate change on socioeconomic uh, development and the well-being of humanity. Without the knowledge um, that uh, a research entity like Scion does, a government would not have access uh, to some of this long-term ecological change information. 
Itemba Labs, the biggest research facility of its kind, not only in the African continent, but in the Southern Hemisphere, utilizes particle accelerators to produce radioisotopes, which are used in nuclear medicine for cancer diagnosis and treatment. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen, through exploration of mechanisms for sustainable management and the provision of research infrastructures, as outlined in this book, I'm confident that this book will contribute to the understanding of research infrastructure platforms in South Africa and the continent and elsewhere, and the opportunities that are presented by that for research, innovation, and skills development partnerships. I thank you. Dr. Klamani, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dr. Gansen Pillay. Dr. Dosami, who we know as Gansen Pillay, is the Deputy Chief Executive Officer responsible for their research and innovation support and advancement, RISA, at the NRF. He's a seasoned academic and has held an NRF rating for over 16 years. Over a period spanning three decades, he has held various academic management and full professorate positions, as well as lead portfolios at the institutional, regional, national, and international levels. Dr. Pillay has spent time as a visiting research professor at Cornell University, USA, the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology in Australia, Gauthier University, Germany, and the Scottish Crops Research Institute in Invengauri, Scotland. Over and above these are achievements, he's a, also a Harvard alumnus. He's a recipient of numerous professional and scholarly awards, including Inter Alia, the Weizmann Institute of Science Emerging Research Award, the NS Oppenheimer Trust Award, and the Foundation for Research Development Young Researcher Award. He's a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Phytopathology Society, and the American Society for Microbiology. On the international front, Dr. Pillay has served on numerous committees, including the Selection Committee for the Future of the Earth Engagement Committee, the International Steering Committee of the Global Research Council, the Council of the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in Austria, where he is currently the vice chair. The Committee for Science and Technology in Developing Countries, Southern and East African Region, and the International Council for Science. Welcome, Dr. Pillay, over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Professor Kope. So distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a privilege and honor to make a few remarks on today's book launch. Uh, congratulations to both Rakesh and Seppo on taking the initiative to record, not just for history, but, as, but for the national system of innovation, the status of the management of research infrastructures in our country. So well done to both of you in producing this book. The National Research Foundation as the premier research funding agency in South Africa has played and continues to play a critical role in ensuring that through our research grant making systems, researchers are provided with state of the art research infrastructure in order to remain globally competitive. Over the years, the NRS National Equipment Program and the National Nanotechnology Equipment Program which were under the uh, supervision of Rakeshni, have played a critical and catalytic role in supporting the national system of innovation in respect of research infrastructure. Colleagues, with the unprecedented impact of COVID-19 and the significant national budget cuts to research public funding agencies, we are challenged at redefining how research is best supported. We are aware of the many systemic challenges facing research funding agencies in Africa. These include, amongst others, weak coordination within the National Science, Technology and Innovation System, limited funding, inadequate and outdated research infrastructure, the lack of basic equipment, and a lack of appropriately skilled human resources. However, government and academia alone cannot address these challenges. We therefore require a quadruple helix approach, which includes government, academia, business and industry, as well as civil society, uh, and all of these are central to addressing this challenge. During these challenges ty challenging times, the community needs to strike a balance between what we see as fundamental research, which unleashes new knowledge, 
as well as the applied research, which sometimes uh, has societal benefits. It is therefore that uh, important that the kinds of policies that we have are enabling and ensures that the research that is being done can be translated. In order to leverage and stimulate innovative research that directly responds to socioeconomic and environmental issues, the NRF is developing strategies that aim to increase its collaboration capacity with industry and other key partners through joint investment and research uh, in human capacity development at higher education institutions. So let us ask, why is this book important? Firstly, it provides us with a platform to take stock of our current research infrastructure and assess whether or not they are used optimally. In a fiscally constrained environment, it is imperative that we as a country do not duplicate resources, but rather provide access for the sharing of resources. A rethink on the rationalization of research infrastructure within institutions is absolutely necessary. And a really uh, visible example of this is the central analytical facility at the University of Stellenbosch, where all analytical equipment has been centralized for use by the researchers and students of the university. Finally, allow me to use this opportunity to provide some ideas for a sequel to this book. The first idea is, uh, relates to rethinking how the NRF and other funders support research infrastructure relating to the humanities and social sciences. What should the architecture and content of these be? How should they be managed? How do we sustain these into the future? Let us reflect on these questions as a community. The second idea relates to the following. A few years ago, I requested Dr. Romila Maharaj and Dr. Prishal to develop a database of all NRF-funded research infrastructure in the country. They had completed this successfully and officially launched the database. This database is being expanded to include all research infrastructure in South Africa. The National Research Foundation Science Granting Council's initiative provides South Africa with a wonderful opportunity to develop a research infrastructure database for the African continent. This would be an important resource not only for scientists within our continent, but also for scientists internationally. Documentation of significant discoveries and innovations on the continent, which would not have been possible without state-of-the-art research facilities, would provide a useful lens to appreciate the impact of scientific collaboration. The NRF through the SGCI and other partnerships in Africa would provide the requisite leadership for advancing and announcing access to research infrastructure on the continent. We look forward to reading your next book, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Pillay. Our next speaker is Dr. Petiwe Matutu. Dr. Matutu is the Group Executive for Strategic Planning and Partnerships at the NRF. Dr. Matutu spent 16 years in academia at various institutions, including Rhodes University, Stellenbosch University, and UCT. She worked at the Department of Science and Technology for nine years as Chief Director in Human Capital and Science Promotion, overseeing human capital development-related entities, the drafting of legislation, guiding documents, and the implementation of HCD and SP programs. Dr. Matutu has served as a member of the Human Resource Development Council of South Africa and was a ministerial appointee in the Council of Walter Sisulu University. She currently serves on the Department of Higher Education and Training Ministerial Task Team, responsible for drafting the implementation plan of the White Paper on post-school education and training. She also serves in the HRDC South Africa on the Mathematics and Science Standing Committee. Dr. Matutu is a PhD in mathematics from the University of Cape Town. Welcome, Dr. Matutu, over to you. Well, good afternoon, Professor Kupe, Dr. Krobela, uh, speakers that we have today, our international partners, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for taking time um, off your busy uh, schedules to attend this event. Congratulations to Rakeshni and Serpo for writing this uh, important book. The NRF is uh, especially privileged to be part of the book launch. Uh, dear colleagues, we are aware 
that some research infrastructure facilities, particularly in physics and astronomy, are so large, complex, or expensive that they require international cooperation to build and run. Others are naturally global in scope as they respond to global challenges or require combined skills, data, and efforts of the world's best scientists. South Africa in particular, the National Research Foundation, is involved in a number of international endeavors dealing with research infrastructures. Although Africa is home to some of the world's largest natural resources and boasts the youngest population, the continent is still grappling with a multitude of challenges and has not taken full advantage of science, technology, innovation opportunities to address some of these challenges. At present, Africa ranks among the least in both production and uh, spending on science, technology, innovation, and R&D. This despite the fact that the continent continues to be a huge consumer of knowledge products. In addition, we find more global north-south collaboration in knowledge production than the global south-south co collaborations. Many of the challenges facing our continent and the globe at large are common and thus require collective approaches. As highlighted by my colleagues, research infrastructures play a large role in collaborative knowledge advancement and in contributing to social, economic, and environmental challenges and opportunities. Despite this important uh, role, not many of our researchers and students, especially in Africa, have access to these key infrastructures and equipment. As such, effective partnerships, especially among science funders in the global north and the Global South is an essential element for achieving increased access to research infrastructure. The need to develop and nurture mutual partnerships across the continent and beyond is crucial for shared progress and in leveraging resources, including research infrastructures and attracting the best researchers in the uh, uh, in the world. Not only do we need close collaboration at the global level, but we must also examine ways for the international community to harness and share the region's vast experience and knowledge potential. This book is as a result of collaboration among the Science Granting Council Initiative partnering, uh, participating countries. The Science Granting Council Initiative is a multi-funder initiative that aims to strengthen the capacities of 15 sci science granting councils in sub-Saharan Africa in order to support research and evidence-based policies that will contribute to economic and social, social development. The Science Granting Council Initiative is an innovative ap uh, approach to partnerships between the Global South and the Global North. The focus of the initiative, among others, is on institutional capacity strengthening through joint programming, co-created with partner science funders and joint funding across the continent. The program has resulted in increased joint research calls, improved grant management systems, and increased engagement among African institutions, to mention a few. So I'm told it was in this program that this book was conceptualized in 2017, where they wanted a clear state or ways in which the National Research Foundation is managing its uh, research infrastructures. So that's where the idea was born. And we're talking about um, uh, 17 countries in the continent, 15 science granting councils, where we are building capacity um, 
both in terms of the programs we offer, in terms of the systems that we have, and leveraging international community uh, funding and resources to build the capacity in Africa. This has enabled us to work very closely together as the continent in advancing research, technology, and innovation. The NRF is further working closely with its partners in Africa and across the globe, is playing a prominent role in the development and implementation of the square kilometer array or the Meerkat radio telescope for now. 15 countries are taking part in the SKA project with additional eight partners countries in Africa taking part in the African VLBI network. Outcomes from these initiatives will not only advance knowledge, but have significant innovation impact on society. For instance, uh, the NRF is using the capabilities gained in the development of the Meerkat to manage the national ventilator project for um, the local design, development, production, procurement of respiratory non-invasive ventilators to support the government's response to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. I can assure you, besides the innovation that has been mentioned here, with this project, we're not going to lose a single cent on corruption due to the experiences that we have or the capabilities that we have in the development of the Meerkat. Dear colleagues, in conclusion, the collective intersection of our common endeavors, our challenges that overlap in the multiple countries and our shared commitment of an inclusive, directed and informed science agenda. This book will further uh, share lessons, deepen and sustain networks on research infrastructure. Thank you for joining in this event to launch the book. Thank you, Dr. Matutu. It is now my honor to welcome the authors. First, I will introduce Dr. Rakeshni Ramato Prishal, who is Head of Research Capacity Development at the University of Pretoria. Prior to joining the University of Pretoria, she had worked at the NRI for 11 years as the Director for Research Infrastructures. Good day, Professor Kupe, Dr. Malapu Kubela, speakers, ladies and gentlemen. The journey towards writing this book started back in 2017, when the National Research Foundation hosted a conference to discuss opportunities that foster investing, building and sustaining research infrastructure platforms as part of the Science Granting Council's initiative of Sub-Saharan Africa. At this event, I delivered a plenary presentation on the journey towards establishing research infrastructure platforms in the country, which shared my experiences during my tenure spanning over a decade as the director for this portfolio at the foundation. Post this presentation, senior representatives from the SGCI community expressed a need to package and share the lessons, the approaches and the experiences for how to establish strategies, policies and processes to firstly set up strategic imperatives within the national research agenda and develop robust resource allocation models for securing dedicated research infrastructure funding. Secondly, to put in place best practices for the awarding of grants. Thirdly, to set up the necessary measures for sustainably managing research infrastructure platforms. And fourthly, to start the planning process for developing much needed research infrastructure roadmaps for their countries. It was against this premise that SEPO, who is from the Strategy Planning and Partnerships Unit at the NRF, had requested me to develop a funding guide on the subject. And by this time, it had qu quickly escalated into a priority deliverable for the SGCI partners. Hence, work had started, and after some time, the amount of information and research that went into the guide became rather overwhelming. And this eventually led us to explore the option of developing this guide into a book. And the rest is history. Here we are. The book has been launched as an open source resource funded by the leadership of the NRF. 
This means it is a free, immediate and permanently available e-resource that acts as a blueprint for partner institutions in sister countries on the continent, the global south and beyond to develop much needed frameworks and roadmaps. It also provides an overview of the building blocks needed across the research infrastructure life cycle, from establishing pertinent strategies and policies, developing robust processes and procedures for grants management, to defining a framework for monitoring and evaluating the investment in research infrastructure platforms. This in itself forms the unique proposition of the book. In essence, it acts as a reference tool at the grant holder or researcher level, as well as at the university, grants management, funding agency and policy levels. The critical message is that the development of world-class infrastructure is a mandatory and necessary prerequisite for realizing the successful transformation to a knowledge-based economy and is integrally linked to human capital development. In a mature science system, the best manner in which to consider the allocation of research infrastructure investments is informed by a strong scientific case that supports novel research that, al that aligns to the priority investment areas of the country, the continent, and global development goals. In addition, there is a strong case to be made for parallel investments in human capital development, including the upskilling and training of the next generation of researchers, operators, engineers and technicians, as well as planning and budgeting for operational costs and costs relating to sustainability. This oftentimes refers to upgrades and maintenance, as well as building and or renovating suitable physical infrastructures to house the research equipment all of which are critical for enhancing impact. Given the contextually rich nature of the information presented in the book, we decided that open source would be the best option. Hence, where the researchers hail from a developing or a developed nation, everyone has a right to ac access this resourceful book. I hope over and above this book being an enjoyable read, it also serves the purpose of being a handbook that paves the way for governments, research funding agencies, universities and the scientific community to embark on the journey towards establishing best practices for grants management and establishing sustainable research infrastructure platforms in their home, institutions and countries. Before I conclude, I would like to thank Dr. Daniel Adams, my mentor in the research infrastructure portfolio, Dr. Clifford Ngomani, my biggest supporter and sounding board, Dr. Ganson Pele and Dr. Petiwe Matutu for their encouragement throughout the two-year writing journey, and Dr. Malapo Kobela for his patronage. A special note of thanks to Dr. Romila Maharaj and Dr. Aldo Strubel. And finally, thank you to Professor Kupe for his leadership and vision, which has helped shape today's virtual event. And on that note, I'd say thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramato Prishal, for that introduction. As one of the authors, I will now go to introduce your co-author, Dr. Sepo Hachingota who is the Director for Strategic Planning and Partnerships at the NRF, respectively, to share his own motivation behind being co-author of the book. Dr. Hachingota, your turn. Thank you a lot, Prof. Kupe, and uh, thank you a lot to all the participants in this event. We are honored to have you here. As my colleagues highlighted, uh, research infrastructure investments are at the heart of research and, in, and innovation value chain. These infrastructures allow us to turn ideas into reality. They allow us to collect data, analyze it, and easily present this large-scale data set. If you speak of, for instance, if you look at astronomy, how do we package that into uh, uh, studies or into th something that we can learn from, uh, uh, from, from the research? Besides these large-scale uh, studies that look at infrastructure, these research infrastructures will allow us to look at these subatomic particles. For instance, now we're speaking of COVID. How do we use research infra infrastructure to unpack what the COVID uh, challenges that we have, as well as to make sure that whatever is coming out of this research is speaking to the development solutions that we are facing as, 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 as a, a country, as a region, and as globally as, 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 uh, as a planet. And, Firstly, before I proceed, let me uh, thank uh, our senior leaders from the National Research Foundation. Uh, we are happy that you were able to join us despite your busy schedules. I would also like to thank uh, the University of Pretoria for hosting us. Thank you, Prof. Cooper, for being here with us. 
Many thanks to our graphics designer, uh, Ms. Georgette Hammond, for all her hard work to make sure that all the, uh, the pieces of the book are brought together. Our many colleagues at the Department of uh, Science and Innovation and the NRF, many thanks for the support, and our CEO as well. Dr. Aldous Froebel, Dr. Romina Maharaj, thank you for the support during the journey of developing this book. And lastly, but not least, I think we'd like to thank our, our families and the friends for just the support during the compilation of, of this book. As explained from our colleagues, this book is, uh, it, it complements the work that the NRF and the Department of Science and Innovation is doing in terms of rolling out the South African Research Infrastructure Roadmap, which aims to drive and adopt a national lens of research infrastructure in the country as well as within the region. Critical elements of this research infrastructure life cycle have been carefully unpacked within this book to highlight the importance of these tools in parallel with other investments such as skills development and the research that the researchers conduct at different research institutions. This book takes us through a journey of how research infrastructure has evolved in South Africa over the last uh, 20 years with a view of sharing lessons with our colleagues in the continent. The book shows cases, research infrastructure lessons, gaps, opportunities, as well as some of the strategic operational, uh, strategic and operational level elements that go into research infrastructure. For the region, government funding agencies, I'm sure you will find this book are quite useful if you speak of the policies, if you speak at operational level, as well as to the students and the research community and the engineers in terms of how these platforms can be made use of generally. Emphasis as well is made on the need of investing both uh, advanced, uh, knowledge advancement uh, 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 skills, for instance, you speak of basic research, but how that should be uh, as well, uh, at, at, the, at the same time, look at uh, investing in, in, in uh, applied research. A good example was, was made earlier on, and I'd, I'd just like to emphasize that. Most of the, of the times we normally uh, overlook some of the things, we look at our cell phones, we look at our computers, but we always forget that without, for instance, theoretical physics, none of these laptops or computers that we have or cell phones that we have would have been come to, uh, to, 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 to life as we know them today. Research infrastructure is at the core of making these uh, uh, theories into practice and at the end of the two products that we use. This book further discusses the role of or the role of uh, funding agencies, the processes that is used in terms of uh, the funding as well as the review process and the awarding process of, of, of research infrastructure. That's very, very key if you're looking at from the researcher perspective. If you're a researcher, you need to know how the processes work. And besides that, the book goes on further to look at the skills needed to operate this research infrastructure. And as we outlined earlier on, if you look at the research infrastructure, these are broad infrastructures. They range from huge infrastructure all the way to small equipment like in the laboratories. All these skill sets need to be amplified and need to be made aware of uh, with various communities. In conclusion, the book presents the monitoring tools of uh, research infrastructure platforms. And at the end as well, we make key recommendations for investing and sustainably managing these uh, research infrastructure platforms. We hope that this book will be of a value uh, for, the, for the different stakeholders. I hope that it will be a toolkit for broader stakeholders, including the funding agencies, especially in the continent, as well as within uh, the policy landscape, if we're developing policies that speak of research and research infrastructure. And lastly, but not least as well, within the university or researcher cohort of our students, our engineers, on how best to look at opportunities of research infrastructures, as, as well as uh, lastly, the private sector from the angle of collaboration. Dear colleagues, uh, faced with the limited uh, funding uh, uh, opportunities within the continent, human resources limitation, infrastructure limitations, I think this is the right time for the region to look at the coordinated approach if you speak of research infrastructure, which is mostly too expensive to manage from uh, each country's perspective. So particularly vital, uh, just to mention now, is the need to work as one within the continent and look at how we can share this research infrastructure, look at how we can share lessons and work, uh, work together as one as we move forward. I thank you a lot for joining us uh, for this event. Thanks, Prof. Kupe. Thank you, Dr. Achingota, for that perspective on the book and what it offers to the, our, our pan-African research communities. 
Now, I would like to say thank you for joining in on our virtual launch. It has been interesting, insightful, and most of all, quite enlightening. And first and foremost, I would like now to thank Dr. Malapo Kubela, Dr. Q, the CEO of the NRF, a special word of thanks to the 15 partner institutions that constitute the Science Granting Cancer Initiative of Sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you to Dr. Romila Maharaj and to Dr. Aldo Strobel for walking the journey with the authors that has led to the, all the learnings being compiled into the book. We extend our gratitude to the high-level speakers from the NRF and the DSI, Dr. Danny Adams, Chief Director, Department of Science Innovation, Dr. Clifford Komani, Deputy CEO, National Research Infrastructure Platforms, Dr. Petiwe Matutu, NRF Group Exec for Strategy, Planning and Partnerships, Gansen Pillay, Deputy CEO, Research and Innovation Support Advancement. Appreciation is extended to Professor Jan Nettling from Nelson Mandela University, Professor Angus Kirkland from Oxford University for their critical comments and inputs to the book. We are also very grateful to Georgette Hammond from the NRF, Rikas Delport, Neo Maseko, Tembi Tlale, and the rest of the communications and marketing team at GOP. Louis Clute Productions for live streaming today's event. Finally, I would like to extend my hearty congratulations to Rakesh and Sepo on their publication. Please, to everyone else, go out and get yourself a copy of this essential read. I will order them to send you their autographs. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Stay safe even under level one. Thank you.